How does microbiome metabolism interact with weight-bearing activity and bone health? That's the question that a new cell metabolism paper aims to address. But before we get to that, I want to give a quick personal aside. When I was a teenager, I was a marathon runner, and honestly, I was pretty good. By age 18, I could run a two-hour, 45-minute marathon, and I was the youngest qualifier for the 2014 Boston Marathon. But then something happened. I developed osteoporosis. I ended up with a tibial fracture, which was the first hint that I was developing osteoporosis a few weeks out from the race. And a few years later, I was diagnosed with the bone density of an old woman. And that raised the question, how did I, a healthy young male, develop osteoporosis? It was so weird. It took years to get a diagnosis. And what I ended up learning was really quite astonishing and relates to the findings of this paper. So I'll get back to my personal story at the end of it, but I wanted to give a real human clinical case, mine, to help frame these data, which I think alone are incredible, but have incredible relevance and something really important to teach us. So I'll wrap it all back at the end, but now to the data. Welcome to my channel. Stay curious. The paper is entitled, Gut Microbial Alterations in Arginine Metabolism Determine Bone Mechanical Adaptation. And it's about how amino acid metabolism in the microbiome, specifically the amino acids arginine and its precursor, citrulline, alters how bones, our bones, respond to mechanical stress to get stronger or not. By way of background, the main bone cell type in question is called the osteocyte. And the osteocyte coordinates bone's response to mechanical stress and kind of serves as a conductor between the osteoblasts, which build up bone, and the osteoclasts, which break down bone. And throughout the study, they used two forms of mechanical loading in mice, a unilateral cyclic compression cycle of the right tibia, which is useful because it allows the left tibia of the mouse to serve as an internal control and treadmill running tasks. So just by way of background, again, those are the kind of two mechanical loading exercises they use, where they use unilateral cyclic compression of one leg and a treadmill running task. Now, in the first experiment, to show the microbiome is important in mediating the response to mechanical stress in terms of bone quality improvement, they took a set of mice and they treated them with broad spectrum antibiotic to wipe out the mice's microbiome and then compared control mice here in black to the mice that were treated with the antibiotics to see how does the bone respond upon loading. And what you see here very clearly is when you give control mice a mechanical stress, this was the cyclic compression cycles, they have improvements in bone quality. You see the black bar with loading is increased on all these metrics of bone quality. But what happens when you give mice antibiotics? That response is eliminated. You see that the blue bar with the loading isn't any higher than the blue bar without the loading. Basically the mice treated with the antibiotics do not have the adaptive response in their bones to mechanical loading. What they then did was go on to identify high responders and low responders, i.e. mice who, when you give them a mechanical stress, in this case, a treadmill running task, have massive improvements in bone density versus those who just naturally don't have improvements in bone density when you give them the same stress. So they took 55 mice and subjected them to six weeks on a treadmill running task and then stratified to see who are the high responding mice and who are the low responding mice and how did they differ. They then wanted to figure out what was unique about the high responding mice versus the low responding mice that might confer the property of the high responders having that massive increase in bone quality in response to mechanical stress. And what they found very interestingly was that the high responders were characterized by levels of a particular gut bug, lactobacillus that were quite high, particularly in the high responding mice. Bringing forward a hypothesis that maybe the lactobacillus were conferring the ability of these mice to have large improvements in bone quality in response to mechanical loading, for example, treadmill running. So they then did two experiments, transplant experiments, to prove causality, where they take mice and they wipe out their microbiomes with antibiotics, then they give them transplants, fecal transplants, poop transplants. From the high responders and the low responders, here shown in green, high responder, and orange, low responder, and see if the mice that have had their microbiomes wiped out by antibiotics but then given transplants from various mice adopt the properties of the mice from whom they got the transplants. And indeed, you see that here, where the mice that got the transplants from the high responders had large improvements in bone quality when they were subjected to mechanical stress. And then they did a similar experiment, but rather than using fecal transplants, they used a specific gut bug, lactobacillus. And what they found was, again, if you give the transplant this time with lactobacillus, you could confer the property of having a great, great response to mechanical stress in terms of improvements in bone quality. So this really showed in a causal manner that lactobacillus were conferring the ability of the high responders to have 
large improvements in bone quality in response to mechanical stress, unilateral compression stress, and treadmill running, which is super cool and super powerful. The next obvious question that arises is what is the key product that is produced by the Lachnus brisei bacteria? What is the key metabolite that confers the effect on the higher responders? What makes the higher responders special beyond the bacteria, but what the bacteria produce, the active component? And what they found was the answer was L-citrulline. L-citrulline is an amino acid. And what happens in the body is L-citrulline is converted by the kidneys into another amino acid, L-arginine. Then L-arginine can serve as a precursor to nitric oxide, a volatile hormone in osteocytes, and that this hormone can improve bone's response to mechanical stress, at least in theory. And this suggests that maybe oral administration of the active component L-citrulline, which can be converted into L-arginine, could make bones more responsive to mechanical stress. Now the question, does that work? And the answer, heck yeah, it does. They gave mice oral administration of L-citrulline. And again, you see the same response, the same response you got with the fecal matter transplant, the same response you got with the lactosporisiae transplant. You see improvements in bones response to mechanical stress with L-citrulline supplementation, which is really cool and has pretty interesting implications. But before I get to those implications, let me just read a quote from the paper because that really hammers it home, I think. L-citrulline administered mice were characterized by significant increases in cortical trabecular bone mass and bone mechanical strength in response to loading. L-citrulline significantly augmented osteoblast-mediated bone formation, osteoblast being the cells that actually produce the bone, reduced osteoclast-mediated bone resorption osteoclasts are the ones that break down bone, and suppressed osteocytic sclerostin in rank L expression, these are some mediators, and osteocyte apoptosis in antibiotic mice subjected to mechanical loading. This is just more jargon for me hammering home the point that the L-citrulline was the active component that conferred the ability of the mice to respond well to mechanical stress. Now, I do want to admit that one thing I'm intentionally skipping over is that oral administration of L-arginine in theory could work, but it actually doesn't work that that well, L-arginine being the derivative of L-citrulline because it's eliminated by the body in a pre-systemic and systemic means. So basically the idea is in terms of supplementation orally, it makes sense to do it with L-citrulline, not L-arginine. That is kind of an aside. Now I know what you're wondering, where can I get L-citrulline in my diet? Well, weirdly, one of the best dietary sources of L-citrulline naturally is watermelon. Watermelon can provide a 250 milligram dose per 154 gram serving, which is pretty high. And you can actually get even more about 60% more from the watermelon rind, which you can make into pickles. So you can make pickled watermelon rind, which is a great source of L-citrulline. You can also get L-citrulline from cucumbers, about 150 milligrams per 300 gram cucumber, and also from zucchini. But in all honesty and transparency, I think if you want to dose up on L-citrulline, probably the best way to go is supplementation in order to get a speculatively therapeutic dose. Because, you know, you actually need to get pretty high doses, maybe something like three grams. For reference, the mice in the study were administered 250 milligrams per kilogram per day, which for a 70 kilogram person would be 17.5 grams of L-citrulline or about 23.7 pound watermelon equivalent per day. And I don't really want to eat 24 pounds of watermelon per day. Granted, again, I think the human therapeutic dose, speculatively, will be a little bit lower. Other studies suggest maybe three grams would be sufficient, but I'm still not a fan of having very, very high levels of a high glycemic index fruit, literally by the kilogram. So for me, what I might try is L-citrulline supplementation. I actually think I will give it a try because I think there are other benefits to L-citrulline that I'm not covering in this video, but it's an amino acid. It's not gonna hurt me. So I think I might give it a try. You can do what you want to do. I just want to confer the data, no medical advice, here, but it is an over-the-counter supplement that's a freaking amino acid. So you can look up L-citrulline benefits and decide for yourself if it's something you want to give a go. Now, returning to my personal story as promised. And now for a sponsored message that I promise to make as brief and painless as possible. If you've been following me, you know I have a passion for sharing nuanced science, and I want to do so in as engaging and entertaining a manner as possible so you can have fun while learning and so I can expand my reach to expand our camp of metabolic health enthusiasts. Don't you want that too? But here's the thing, I'm at a distinct disadvantage because I'm not a career influencer, I'm not salaried, I'm a researcher, a PhD researcher, and a medical student. So I depend on philanthropic support, including for my friends at Rx Sugar, who I truly believe are a metabolic wellness company disguised as a food company. So if you want, you can consider trying their products, including their incredible Rx syrups, 
their Swelfy sticks, and their awesome Swelfy snack bars. I don't generally have a sweet tooth, but I have to admit, they're pretty delicious. And if you want to try these products, you can try my discount code, Nick20, for 20% off. But before you do so, I'd actually suggest taking a look at the deep dive I did on allulose and fructose below. So you learn about the science behind these products and why I think they're pretty awesome. And then afterwards, if you think it's a tool that you or a loved one can use, consider giving it a try. And thank you for hearing me out, and thank you for being a citizen scientist. Now returning to my story, as promised. I developed osteoporosis because of a very, very rare mutation that impairs my bone's ability to respond to mechanical stress, just like the mice in this study treated with antibiotics or the low responder mice that are deficient in lactinosporiceae. I don't know what my lactinosporiceae levels are, maybe I'll get them tested, but for me, it had to do with a rare genetic mutation. Now, that was a discovery that took a couple years to get to, but once we had it and we had the diagnosis and we had the ideology, it allowed me to undergo some experimental therapies, especially for my demographic, young healthy male. And over time, I reversed my osteoporosis or I with my doctors reversed my osteoporosis. I no longer have incredibly weak bones and I can do just about anything. Although I don't distance run more or less for my own safety and just because I don't want to deal with the headache of getting more fractures. But I think that's just a beautiful example of how even if there aren't say randomized controlled trials on a population, understanding the physiology can help inform individual experimental sometimes treatments that can really help people as they help me. So I prefer if people don't scoff this off as just a mouse study because it gives us a lot of really interesting insight into physiology and helps us understand how things like the microbiome and amino acid metabolism can connect to lifestyle activities, running, and bone health. And I think putting that puzzle together does require basic and translational science, mouse models, and those can be incredibly valuable. I hope you found these data interesting. I thought they were incredibly exciting and I appreciate all of you for joining me in nerd enthusiasm and sticking with me through these paper breakdown videos. I have a lot of fun with them. I hope you enjoy them as well.